interesting one. <laughs> so basically, this is similar sort of stuff. We're going to do just cases, but this time where it's going to work is we're going to give you a very, very short presentation, um, not that much information, a couple of lines um, of someone you see, and then we're going to give you their blood film um, with a particular um, cell type or result, which we want you to tell us what that is. Firstly, and I think it's an SBA format, we did an SBA format, and then afterwards, right after that, we're going to ask you what you think the underlying diagnosis is, and then we're going to go through all the possible options. I think we've got um, four or five of them. Before we start, um, there's 50 of you in this call, and on the polling thing that we're using, which is the details are in the chat, there's only 15 of you. So can you just make sure you jump onto that, because otherwise it's uh, like you won't be able to answer the questions. So the details on how to join that are in the chat at the top should i give it a couple of seconds yeah let, let's just I'll, let me tell you how many people, as soon as we get to 40 yeah. people on this thing we can start we, we we thought it would be this best way to teach it rather than just like telling you what sort what cells go with what disease it's, it's better if you work it out and then we can explain why you thought it was that or why it isn't that and i think we, we can go through them all um we include all the really key ones we think that are important um yeah. It's not comprehensive, but no. I think Jake has put the stuff. Yeah. J Jake loves heme, in case you haven't noticed. And it's I the stuff he thinks is important. I've, I made a big... Anyway, we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, so uh, should, we, should we get going? Yeah, we can start. Okay, so so this is the first presentation. As I said, very short. Um, I haven't even told you how old or what gender they are, but um, someone has abdominal pain, they have bloody diarrhea, and they have raised urea and creatinine. Okay. And I want to take that in. And then this is their blood film. So I'll give you a second look at that. You're going to be able to see on the next slide. But if everyone just has a look. And then now I'm going to move on to this. So here we go. here's a blood film again. Remember, they have um, they had the presentation. I'll go back really quickly in case you forgot. Abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, and raised urea and creatinine. And then on the, is there a poll? Sorry, Anush, I haven't got it up. Is there a poll that they can do? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, so what is seen on the film? Is it schistocytes? Is it how jolly bodies? Spelt wrong, that's my bad. Is there basophilic stippling? Are there papanima bodies or are there sickle cells? Okay, and it's just let, I can't see it. It's just let me know what people have put. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's on a separate thing. In okay, the internet. Yeah, 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 okay, cool. So Again, we're this gonna, is, yeah, yeah. We'll wait for maybe 80% of you to answer. Yeah, so most, so 85% of you went for option A, followed by 7% for option D. Okay, good. So next question. So we're not going to talk about the next question. What is the most likely cause of this presentation going from the blood film and the presentation to the four? So is it A, TTP, B, HUS, C, sickle cell, D, post strep? glomerular nephritis or D polycystic kidney disease okay so again 80% of you have gone for option B and a few of you have gone for D and A good okay right so Let's move on. That's very good. So well done, everyone. So that was right. So the majority went for it. These are schistocytes. OK, so we're, where we're going to do this, we're going to talk about what we can sort of see. So first, when we see a blood film, I always it's important to look at what the shape of the cells are, what color they are and how many they are. So if we go for the shape, first of all, schistocytes are basically red blood cells that have been sliced up like a pizza into really, really small bands or fibrin bands. And the most common cause of this is intravascular hemolysis, which basically means that inside the blood vessels, they've been broken down into small parts. The most common cause of that is microangiopathic anemia. And we talk about three parts. We talk about DIC, HUS, and TTP. So first of all, very good for everyone in their sites, because then that sort of narrows you down. Now with the presentation of possible renal failure and bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain, our most likely cause here is HUS, so very well done as well. So HUS, I always found a bit confusing, but we break it down into just like the simple parts. 
is the microangiopathic hemolytopenia, which means that there's hemolytic breakdown, which is what it means, of the red blood cells inside the blood vessels, um, which results in red cell fragmentation. The reason this happens is because of the E. coli virotoxin is one of the most common causes, which causes the basically platelet consumption and then fibrin de deposition inside the renal vascular. So it's all happening because of a certain type of toxin which affects the kidneys. This basically causes mechanical destruction of passing red blood cells from these thrombosis that happens because of the, vir the virotoxin. And you see the, shir the schistocytes on the blood film as to help your diagnosis. And the main management is plasma exchange. Okay. So the other thing is, what other investigations will you do for HUS? So in, I'm not sure, would you just put it on the chat? Or do you want to do it on the, yeah. So it's right on the chat. What, if, if someone you were considering, could this be HUS? What other things would you like to do? Good. Clotting. Definitely anyone who's got anemia, you want to make sure that look at their clotting profile. Yeah. Did you worry about E. coli? Very good. Okay, nice. I like those. I like those a lot. And then yes, you want to check their you you want to check their renal function. It's, a, it's an absolute must. So Perfect. First of all, I got the first thing you do, probably bedside. Always good. I know this not, didn't excel to do what bedside, but bedside first, urine dip. You're probably see hematuria and proteinuria pointing to a slight renal dysfunction. You'd uh, also, I, I'd possibly do a peripheral blood film, which would show schistocytes. And as you rightly said, full blood count differential looking at you will show low platelets and low hemoglobin. Just because you're getting low platelets because of a um, the, the buildup and thrombosis, which com which com which Eats up all the. Oh, it's gone down again. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, sure. so Don't worry. Yeah, okay. So basically, you get a breakdown of the uh, of the red blood cells because of these thrombosis that are being formed, and those thrombosis use up platelets. Let me just get back to it, guys. We cannot take control of the slides. That'd be really, really good. Um, you need to take control. Very good. Uh, so sorry, go back to here now. Good. And then also perfect. So you want to check clotting. And HUS has normal clotting because the problem, the reason their the red blood cells are broken down or then making thrombosis is not because of clotting problems. They have normal clotting. The problem is an uh, external um, cause, which is the E. coli virotoxin. Okay, so really important, normal clotting. Nice. Okay, now something else is TTP. So again, another cause of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Give a bit of physiology here, because I think actually, even though you, you probably don't need to know this in this much detail, it kind of helps you understand what's going on. So before we had increased amount of thrombosis being made, blood clots, because of the E. coli toxin. Here, we have a decreased amount of a protein, which is, ne which is needed to cleave von Willebrand factor. If that doesn't cleave, or an, and von Willebrand factor isn't cleaved or, or recycled, then you continue to, your platelets continue to aggregate, because platelets bind onto von Willebrand factor, and that's how they clot, and how they make clots. Because of that, you have all these clot formations causing inside the blood vessels, and that causes damage to the kidneys, causing AKI. And also, these clots can happen inside the brain, and I am not entirely sure of the, of the underlying cause here, but they tend to present sometimes, not always, but in the SBA world they do, with CNS signs, so seizures, hemiparesis, and problems in their vision. Again, you have schistocytes but normal clotting, as the problem is not with the clotting factors, it's to do with breaking down the clots. So the, the clotting process is normal, but they're just not being broken down. And uh, some causes, such as quinine and certain cancers, that can predispose you to getting TTP. So do you see the difference here? HUS is caused mostly by E. coli, so something that causes gastroenteritis, stool culture, and causes amount of clotting to build up. TTP is when you literally can't break down those clots the clots aren't going to be recycled. Therefore, it, it blocks those vessels and any blood cells coming through are just going to be sheathed like that into the pizza. Okay, perfect. So very, very good. Um, Is there any questions? I will just, I'll just add on one thing. So yeah. I think the CNS signs, is it, it, sometimes this can be misdiagnosed as a yeah. GIA. And the other thing is, if you had to pick one of these where AKI is more common, it is slightly more common in HUS than in TTP, but because you have occlusion, it can occur in both. But it's a key feature of HUS. 
yeah. I'm so I don't know what the underlying cause of the CNS signs is. I presume it's because of the clotting again, but yeah. I, I'm not sure. But that in SBA world, they tend to present with seizures and hemiparesis. Okay, perfect. So now another one. Uh, this is someone who has colicky abdominal pain, which is worse after food. He has splenomegaly, and they recently ate these foods in this bowl. Okay. Now here is their blood film that we took very, very quickly. And the arrow is point, possibly pointing to you what is the abnormality here, or what, what, is, what could be normal, actually. So here's the options. Here's the blood film again. Is this A, bite cells, bur cells, blister cells, hind bodies, or how jolly bodies? Um, am I giving enough time for the presentation? I feel like I'm rushing it a bit. Shall I go back to it? Or is it um, not yeah, I mean, people will ask, ask if we're going too fast. Yeah, so it goes too fast. You don't worry about it. Okay, okay. So I'll give everyone the time to go through that. I'm sorry it's a bit small on here, but it helps to have them both side by side. So that's most of you. 80% um, of you have gone for option D and 20% of you have gone for option E. Okay, that's exactly how I thought it would be. Okay. So before we go on to what the what it actually is, what does everyone think the underlying cause is? Do they think it's hereditary, her, hereditary I can never pronounce that word, hereditary spherocytosis, G6PD or G6PD deficiency, post splenectomy, thalassemia, or sickle cell? Should be open now. Perfect. I've never seen so many people answer a question so quickly. <laughs> Everyone, um, just, everyone loves hematology. <laughs> yeah, clearly. Uh, so 95% of you have gone for option B. Okay, good, good, good. So everyone went for that. Nice one. Okay. So these were hind bodies, and they are very, look very similar to how Jolie bodies, as I reminded myself yesterday when I was going through this. So they look very similar. The I, know, I don't think a question will ever be. Um, just asking you to say what it is based on the picture. There will always be a, a, a background stem saying how they present. And Heinz bodies tend to be pathognomonic of G6PD, um, which is what the answer to that one was, which everyone seems to know. But they also can appear in thalassemia, but they tend to be in Heinz bodies. Now, uh, I put here, what else may you see in G6PD? So what else could you possibly see other than Heinz bodies on a blood film of someone who's got G6PD? Beans, means Heinz, exactly. Heinz, beans. Thanks, Anoush. <laughs> so anyone want to post in the chat what they see? Okay, bite cells? Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys know this better than I do. Very good. So first of all, G60D. So this is X-linked, and it's a defect in the red blood cells. And they can be asymptomatic, so they could just never have a presentation. But what happens is they have an oxidative crisis, so what that, we're, we're, we're going to go exactly through what a blister cell is. Um, basically, what happens is, is that you have a red blood cell defect, and then you have an oxidative crisis. So you have a decreased amount of G6CD, which causes you to have a decreased amount of glutathione, which basically means that the red cell is, is at an increased susceptibility to oxidative stress. And then the way you diagnose it is you end the assay um, above eight weeks after the last, uh, last crisis to see the level of G6PD. Okay. And one of the causes, hold on, are flava beans, is what you see here. Classic spam. They have flava beans and have G6PD. Um, so, answer your bite cells. These are bite cells. This is what they look like. Someone's taken a bite out of them. Not so schistocyte, that isn't a word. But as you can see, they literally look like someone's, look a bit of pac man -y, But someone's taken out a little bite there. And a Heinz body, as you can see, it's got like this, on a, you see on a super vital stain, it's got this little red, I'm sorry, blue dot here around the cell. OK, um, red blood cells is what you should see. Red blood cells should be how they should look. It's like here. Can you see my mouse? They should be nice, round, no blemishes. They can't see your oh, mouse. Oh, right. All right. But you know which one I'm talking about. So the one, so, so this, uh, the one, the one next to the bite cell, they, they, they're good. They look nice and round. They have no blemishes in them. OK, so this is the next one. Uh, tell us questions? if you want us to slow yeah, down, yeah, or if they have yeah. any questions. We can go slower. We're gonna. I'm gonna send out a my full summary of of all the different blood films you can get with every single presentation they could come with afterwards. But this is like the really key stuff. 
So sorry, we're going a bit quickly, um, but we can slow down. So this is the next presentation. So this, this is a, a, a child who presents in the first year of life with failure to thrive um, and hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, their blood film already has hyperchromic microcytic anemia, and they also have this image on a skull x-ray. Okay, so this is what they have on their blood film. If you want to look a, a few seconds to have a proper look at that. Okay. And then what is shown, oh, my, the spelling of this is terrible. What is my fault, my bad. What is shown on the blood film? Is it A, basophilic red blood stippling, B, target cells, C, Walmart cells, D, John Lewis cells, or E, Asda cells? I can only apologize. I won't give this is probably else. this is probably the single most important thing in, yeah. or if you cut into recognizing the blood film. Yeah. Uh, I, I won't give it that long to this one, but so ninety-five percent of you have gone for option B. And I'm um, afraid that is wrong. Is it? it's not. It's not. It's right. It's not Walmart cell. Very very good. Yes, this is target cells. So before we move on. The next question is, what is the most likely underlying diagnosis? So I'm, I'm going to go back quickly to the presentation before I give you all the options. So just everyone have a look at this again. What the x-ray is, and how they present. So first year of life, failure to thrive. Okay. And then, one second. Okay, cool. So is it sickle cell, beta thalassemia minor, alpha thalassemia, high drops fatalis? Cooley's anemia or G6PD again? Could be again. We could be really want to going down on G6PD. G6 could be an option. Ooh, slightly slower this time. Mm, I thought it would be. Okay, so around 70% of you have gone for option B, and then around 15% have gone for A and C. A and C. Okay. So B was the most. Did you say B? Sorry. Anish. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay. So let's go for it. So very well done, everyone. These are target cells. I'm sorry. I couldn't think of any sort of differential. Reasonable to it. differentials. <laughs> Reasonable differentials. The other ones are, I promise. That was the only silly one. Uh, but these are known as Mexican hat cells, which is, I heard a doctor describe them as that. So, but I don't think it's proper use of the word but yeah mexican hat cells um they are red blood cells with central staining a ring of pallor and an outer rim of staining so they look like a hat on top so looking down from above so they are seen in liver disease uh hypersplenism sickle cell thalassemia and ida now i may i am going to take um uh you know some praise for this because i came up with this mnemonic myself uh which is that soldiers go and do target practice on the hills or in the hills, I should say on, again, terrible spelling, but on the hills. So hills is hypersplenism, I is IDA, L is liver disease, and S is sickle cell and thalassemia. Um, so that's a good mnemonic. And I think it's the most important one because it tends to be the most common question when they talk about blood films is target cells. And they come up a lot and because they're seen a lot of different presentations. So it's a really good SBA. Um, so those are the most important ones. Okay, now let's go for the next one. So thalassemia. It was thalassemia, the answer, but which one? So we're going to go through it. So first of all, what is thalassemia? So thalassemia is about hemoglobin. It's unbalanced hemoglobin synthesis when you have less or no production of one globin chain. What happens is that these unmatched chains, they cause precipitates, which then damage the red blood cell membrane and then cause hemolysis, but whilst they're still in the bone marrow. So that it's not microvascular, it's not in the blood vessels, but in the bone marrow. Right, now, it's classically said that in Mediterranean, I just want to put a question mark here because I think that there was a very interesting talk recently about um, uh, how medicine in terms of um, stigmatizing patients when they come in and the whole recent um, Black Lives Matter. Um, SBA, they'll always say it's Mediterranean. Just as the little thing, if some Mediterranean comes or they can say they have Mediterranean origin, doesn't mean you think this person's got thalassemia if they got uh, red blood cells. But yeah, I just put a little question mark there. But in SBA world, Mediterranean tends to be the SPA that they tend to give. Okay, so 
And other things you see on thalassemia fields, uh, they call them anis, anis cytosis, which basically means the red blood cells are of unequal size. So some are bigger, some are smaller. And also they say they have poikolocytosis, which basically means they have different shape. And the classically they say they have teardrop, which you can see on, if you look at the top left, they look like quite teardrop cells. Okay. Does anyone know what condition that poikilocytosis is also important in another condition, non-thalassemia? I mean, Jake knows the answer, but year fours. Yeah, myelofibrosis. Good. Great. I love, I love myelofibrosis. It's so good. All right. So yeah, tear, teardrop cells, very, very good. And also, but you can also see them in thalassemia. Um, okay. So now, um, again, I think this is important because you kind of need to understand why you get traits and major thalassemia. So thalassemia is this, it's the beta globin genes, it's the B1 and B2, and you need two of them, or you don't need two of them, but one of them gets damaged or both get damaged in thalassemia. So in beta thalassemia, you break it down to minor or major. Minor is your carry state. That was the B plus means that one of them isn't working and the other one is, and they tend to be asymptomatic with normal hemoglobin. In major, always known as Cooley's anemia, they tend to present in the first year of life and there's abnormality in both beta globin genes. So it was it like 15% for that one? Those I was correct answer. The correct answer was Cooley's anemia because they presented early in first life, not minor. Difficult question, but it, it does come up and they, it's called Cooley's anemia. So everyone, well done for everyone realizing it was thalassemia, but it's the major part. So it's Cooley's anemia. And this is the one that tends to present in the first year. Okay. Um, and this is also it. So beta fal major, always known as Cooley's anemia, is severe anemia. They have failure to thrive. And they also have extra medullary hematopoiesis, which means that because they're, they're, they're being broken down so frequently in the bone marrow, the bone marrow just is unable to work. And because of that, I'm going to go back to it. Sorry, sorry. Let me go really quickly to the presentation. You get this hair on end sign. Can you see here on the top? You could all look like there's some above, above, above where the skull is. You get this hair on end sign. That's because there's a hematopoiesis inside the skull and causing the skull to expand when they're very young, pushing the plates apart. So that's why you get this hair on end sign, because they, the, the, the bone marrow just isn't, isn't working as it should do. Okay, let's get back to it. Okay. Okay, so you do get hepatospelomegaly because of, of, of breakdown of extra, extra medullary um, uh, organs. And the management, there is lifelong blood transfusion needed which tend to be two to four weekly transfusions. Now, what is the risk of having lifelong blood transfusions? Just comment in the chat what you think could be the problem of someone having blood transfusions two or four times weekly for most of their life. Good. Iron. Hemochromatosis is, is, a, is a disease they talk about a lot, but you can get increased iron deposition um, Exactly, in the pancreas and glands, very good. So what happens is because there's too much iron, they deposit and they tend to deposit in the pituitary, thyroid and pancreas and other places and also the heart. So that's why they predispose you to diabetes because they damage the pituitary. And they tend to cause something called myocardial siderosis, which just means it's, like, it's a type of um, deposition of iron in the myocardium. And you, they need, and you need frequent echoes to make sure they haven't, this hasn't happened. And, excuse me, and you present this, prevent this from happening by giving them chelators. But it is a considerable risk for anyone who needs constant transfusions. Okay, now alpha thalassemia. So I always got confused between the two. So I'm gonna, I should have put this this diagram again. But here we go. So you have two betas and four alphas. Okay. Now the betas, if you don't have either, you can still have life, um, because the hemoglobin is able to compensate. The alphas is very different. Think about the alpha of the group. They are the big boys. They kind of need to be working quite well for to have any real sense of life. And we're going to go through what that actually means. Okay. So in alpha thalassemia, you have two separate alpha globin genes on each chromosome 16. And each of those alpha globin genes code for four alpha, alpha proteins, alpha globins. So that's alpha, 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 alpha. Now, Bart hydrops or death in utero. Um, is basically when you don't have any of the alpha genes working. That basically means is that the, 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 the fetus is not, is not compatible with life and they will die in utero. Um, Hydrox vitalis, for example, they have an increased amount of effusion inside their um, third spaces and they unfortunately aren't compatible with life. 
is you have one alpha and then but the other two from the other other genes aren't working then you have monosteremia and hepatosplenomegaly but if you have both alphas working for one gene or one alpha working from each of the other genes then they are asymptomatic carriers okay so not as it's not as well tested as it's quite rare relative to beta thalassemia but something to be aware of and the thing they tend to ask about is hydrops fatalis and hydrops fatalis or bart hydrops anush i think that's the same thing i i, I bart hydrops and hydrops fatalis yeah so, i think okay. it, i think that's just okay. an i old had it joke. i had it in my in my book as bart hydrops i'm pretty sure it also means hydrops fatalis that is death in utero not compatible with life okay has anyone got any questions on thalassemia before we move on to the next one as i appreciate is it's quite it's, it's probably the the, the biggest one of the biggest topics in hematology. We'll be okay. All good? Okay. So next one. So this is your next presentation. So this is a three-year-old child. I've, I've given you their age this time. Um, and they have been complaining that the hands and feet feel very painful when they get cold. They present to a &E with severe organomegaly anemia and shock and an operation is done. Uh, at the same time, they've done a, an x-ray for some reason. Someone clever decided to do it. And this is what their femur looks like. Okay. So an, an operation is done. I just want to, no confusion, is not to do with the femur. It's a different operation. Okay. So everyone have a good look at that. I'll move on to the next film. Okay. Here we go. Here's the film. In a few seconds, I have a look at that before I move on to the, to the SPA. Okay. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I was not here. Okay. Um, I can go if, if people want me to go back to it. I, I will. But what is seen on the blood film is a left shift, reticulocytes, right shift, how jolly bodies or papanima cells. I can, I can go back to the film if you want me to. But I'll give people a, a couple of seconds to fill out the poll. So 80% of you have gone for option D, and then a few of you have gone for B and E. Oh, and you can flick through. Oh, can you do that themselves? Oh, nice. Yeah, they can. Very good. Very good. Okay. No worries. I'll, I'll stop being so panicky about it. Good. So, what, so I missed that. I'm really sorry. Did he, which one? Which option? Most, most of them went for option D, and a few went for B and E. B and E. Okay. Very good. And then... Ooh. What is the most likely cause of this presentation? A thalassemia crisis, a sickle cell crisis, parvovirus, Neisseria meningitis, or chronic liver disease? I thought you said chronic Lyme disease for a second. I was like, oh, Lyme disease. Can you, no. get, can you get chronic Lyme disease? I mean, Probably. I don't. Th I'm not sure whether it's actually. I don't think it's actually a thing in the evidence yet. Yeah. It's like that thing Justin Bieber had, right? Oh yeah, he had, and the whole world went mad for Lyme disease. It was so it was so in. Lyme disease was so in. <laughs> All right, is everyone is everyone ready? How are we doing for the poll? Uh, they have voted, so eighty percent of them went for B, uh, fifteen went for C, and then okay. a few went for D and E. Good. This is a, this is a hard question. Okay, so let's go through what the blood film was showing first. So these were how Jody bodies. Very good. And as I said, guys, they look very much like Heinz bodies. So. Props or anyone is able to differentiate them just by looking at them. I definitely can't. But again, it depends on the it it, pen, it depends on the presentation. So what these are? These are DNA nuclear rem remnants in red blood cells, which are normally removed by the spleen. So the spleen's job, we're gonna which we're gonna go through, is basically to recycle red blood cells when it comes to the end of life, break them down into their parts, uh, and the heme and bilirubin, which is then recycled, um, and and at the liver. But in the spleen, there's basically like the end of the line for red blood cells. Anyone know how long red blood cells last for? What's the lifespan of a red blood cell? Important, important for diabetes management as well. What a classic consultant question. Not 90 days. 100, ooh. Hold on, I need to work this out. What is, what's three months? It, how many days is it, that? It's 90 to 120 days. Those are the two okay, limits. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Both of I was like, right. Okay, good, good, good. Well, well done to everyone. Uh, yes, 90 to 120 days, good. So that's how long red blood cells tend to last. And the reason they're important in diabetes, I'm sure you know, is because of HbA1c. 
Okay, so they're seen in postsplenomectomy and in hypersplenism. So hypersplenism basically means that the spleen obviously isn't working as it should be. Um, and there are a number of causes of this. And the chief ones you need to know are sickle cell, celiac, IBD, and myeloproliferative diseases. We're not going to go into the last three today. We are going to talk about sickle cells. So very good, everyone. Oh, oh, um, I, we haven't done a poll on this one. So does anyone know what these are if I told you that it was sickle cell? It, it, this is now post splenectomy, sorry, or sp or hypersplenism, or, or both. Does anyone know what these are in the chat? Like, perhaps anyone that does. Yeah, very well done. Very well done, Leanne. Yeah. These are these are papillary bodies. So basically, these are not as often seen, but can be seen. And these are basically granules of sideroblasts, which are, and what a sideroblast is, as something that I wasn't really aware of that much, are abnormal red blood cells that has iron granules that are not part of hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin, obviously, the heme part is into iron, but then the iron granules can also be in other parts of the red blood cells. So as you go back to it, can you see how like there's little dots there? Those are the iron granules, I think. And they've seen in lead poisoning is a classic uh, SBA. What would you see on a blood film when someone's got lead poisoning, papillary bodies? I don't know why it matters. Like any, uh, let me just check your blood film whilst we whilst you die from lead poisoning. Uh, but but also um, in, and more importantly for this presentation in post splenectomy. Okay, so sickle cell, and this is what this what sickle cell again is abnormal beta globin. It's autosomal recessive, um, and it is either homozygous, which is SS or heterozygous, which is AS. A is normal. So anyone who's got A is fine. AS means that one of the globins isn't working, but the other one is, and that's trait. So in trait, um, unlike uh, thalassemia, uh, in trait, they can be, they are asymptomatic, but if they have hypoxia, some can have vaso-occlusive crises, which we're going to go over in a second. And the reason this happens is because the HBS polymerizes and, uh, and when deoxygenated, and they deform and form this sickle shape. And the way you diagnose this is on HB electrophoresis because of the way the, 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 the size of the cells, they can be, you can see the amount of sickle go up, HBA and HBA on your HB electrophoresis. Okay, so what is a vaso-occlusive crisis? So this is what they were complaining about at the first. The guy said that, or the, the, the guy, I'm not sure what sex they were, but the person was, was saying that they were having uh, constant pain in their hands. This is it, this microvascular occlusions. So when you get cold, it triggers, I'll go back to it, it triggers this sickling, is what they call, and the sickling blocks the vessels and causes like um, hypoxia and real intense pain, tends to be in the hands. And if they're less than three years old, and this happens constantly, they can develop dactylitis, which is the sausage finger. This, they can also have mesenteric ischemia, so gut pain, like um, all around the stomach. And as this happened before, I should have asked, but you can also get a vascular necrosis, which is, oh, go back, go back to it really quickly. A vascular necrosis, which was here. So as you can see, there's deformed amount of femur, which is not nice aligned. And this is classically what is seen. And I can't give you any more information of that because it's been a, over a year since I did any ortho. But yes, this is a vascular necrosis. Um, okay, sorry, go back. Now, parvovirus, I think we're about to discuss that in a second. So a plastic crisis, so parvovirus. So anyone that said parvovirus, you're not wrong. Um, the presentation was pointing more towards a crisis, but it could have been a plastic crisis. We don't know. But with, with it, the, I, think, I think it was an unfair question. But with, with, with parvovirus, they tend to be at risk of something called a plastic crisis, which means that the bone marrow completely stops making anything. They're, they're increased risk with this. And you get a decreased amount of red blood cells uh, in the circulation, decreased amount of production, and it's self self limiting. Okay. Oh, and yes, it is B19. I think um, I think I was on vitamin B12 lines. My bad. Yes. So 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 self limiting as well. The next. So what, then, go on. While we're talking about parvovirus, just briefly. So what yeah. rash do people get when they get parvovirus? Kids especially. It's one of those weird ID things that yeah, uh, slap cheek rash and. If someone gets a slap cheek rash, what are you going to tell them to do? Like, who do they want to avoid? Again, more relevant uh, uh, next year, but it, it's still relevant to team. Do you know who you would avoid if you were parvovirus B19 positive? So, 
anyone who has parvovirus B19 should avoid contact with any pregnant women because it can cause it's another cause of we talked about hydrox fatalis this is another cause of it oh it was just lagging and all of them came at once yeah you are all correct <laughs> it's a good way well, well done, everyone knows that i didn't know that last yeah. year that's very very good yes exactly you don't want to be giving any um, pregnant women parvovirus as it, it's another cause of hydrox fatalis as a new set but that's more for next year but very good very good knowledge um Yes, pregnant women. Oh, they all put it there. Oh, this came in for me as well. Oh, mad. Okay, so does anyone... Oh, do you know how long Ooh, it takes? A couple of questions. So, so the, the, how jolly bodies can develop before splenectomy? So, um, it, it, it can happen in hypersplenism uh, because the spleen, how jolly bodies are basically red blood cells that just aren't being broken down properly. So, you think about it, if you have a car factory and that car factory stops having people work there over a short amount of time, then that factory will already be producing cars, will already be decreasing their production. And the, and the spleen's job is to get rid of red blood cells. So you would already have how, how jolly bodies. They'll obviously be more um, obvious once you have your spleen removed. As Once you shut down the factory completely, there's obviously not going to be any reduction happening. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but yes, you would see it before. It's, I don't... It's, it's my I, I don't... I don't think you would need to, they would ever ask you about how long it takes them to develop. No. Because I think and also, it it's not important. But what, what, what is important is to know that it can happen both in hypersplenism and splenectomy. So it doesn't just happen from splenectomy. Um, we're going to go over, Prina, we're going to go over what secretion, the difference between the two in a second. Okay. Um, does anyone know in the chat what's happening here in this person with this x-ray? Okay, nice. Yes, this is a chest crisis. Very, very good. Um, so this is acute chest syndrome or crisis. Basically what happens is, is, is again, you have sickling which blocks the vessels. All these crises kind of depend on blood pooling. And we're going to go through the difference between various occlusive and secretion in a second. In, pulmonary vascular, in a pulmonary vascular crisis, this can also happen because you get fat amines in the bone marrow, but not as commonly, basically because the bone marrow just is just having a terrible time it can create fat embolisms from a creating amount of inflammation that's happening there, and that can go off into circulation and do basically the same drug as a PE does, um, but it's one of the other causes. Uh, and you tend to, these, before you get chest ab abnormalities, they tend to present with a pain crisis. They talk about chest pain, they have fever, they have a wheeze, they have a cough, and they'll be quite tacky. So, so they, it's a serious condition, um, which you need, really need to watch out for. And you manage with oxygen analgesia bronchodilator, and okay yeah i can go back to it so um you have pulmonary infiltrates and pleural effusion do you see how you have a slight blunting of the costophrenic angles bilaterally and you have some of the pulmonary infiltrates if i can convince you which are it should be nice and black but you can see how it's like quite white and wispy if i'm perfectly honest guys i'm terrible at chest x-rays i only know that because i saw it on radiopedia before and how they described it but I think I, we can agree there's a slight blunting of the and angles of pulmonary effusions, uh, pleural effusion, sorry, and pulmonary infiltrates. What do you think, Anish? With an eye of faith, I would uh, with back an eye of the faith, faith with I would back the infiltrates. Exactly, pulmonary yeah. infiltrates. But, 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 but as I, Jake said, yeah. he, like your lung feel should be nice and uh, a bit darker than they are in this. This isn't something that that's likely to come up in exams, but like just for your own information, you can see how what appears to be the vasculature goes out a bit further and it's a bit brighter than you would expect. Again, it's kind of nonspecific. And again, eye of faith. Eye of faith is very, very important. Um, so yes, so um, you tend to treat them blind antibiotics. Um, we're going to go through why you would give these ones specifically. Uh, but again, with any antibiotics that you learn, remember that it depends on the local guidelines. So it will differ depending on which site you're at. But you definitely want to cover them for any infections that could be on top of this. Um, and then management, you tend to you tend them to ITU if they're going to respiratory failure as well, and they may need to have um, uh, um, I've forgotten what it's called again. Um, they have the blood removed and put back in. I've forgotten that I had a bit of a mind blank there. Um, but yes, the most important Plasma thing is that, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, basically, you, you need to manage the oxygen, analgesia, and bronchodilators. But they tend to present first. Sorry to highlight the point again, 
with this sort of chest pain, fever, wheeze and cough. So anyone who's got sickle cell or could possibly have sickle cell, um, always consider that their presentation, first of all, obviously don't disclude PEs, as this could also be a very common presentation of a PE, uh, but always have at the back of your mind, could this be an acute chest syndrome? Okay. Now, as we're going to go for, what's the difference between a sesquate, this crisis and a vaso-occlusive crisis? So, sesquation crisis is talking specifically about organs. It's talking about pooling of blood, specifically in the spleen, but also the liver. In vaso-occlusive crisis, that's talking more about your small vessels, your microvascular disease, and that's why you get painful crisis in your hands. And then the reason this is important is this is all we're talking about before. So this guy we're talking about at the beginning, the three-year-old, he had um, organomegaly, anemia and shock, and he, this was because he had pooling of blood in the spleen. Simply because the spleen isn't working as well, it's, the, it's, being, it, it's, it's, just, it's just not, it's not being able to deal with the amount of uh, sequestration that's going on inside it. And it, it's, it causes all this blood to be pulled and the, and the spleen begins to stop working. A majority of children will need a splenectomy and we're gonna go through the reasons why that is bad. So first of all, splenic infarction, these tend to happen before the age of two and the spleen increases the susceptibility to infections. There's poor growth. You can have pigmented gallstones. Um, and if it is removed, what will be prescribed to the patient? So what would he give to the patient after they've had their spleen removed? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pen V. I, I would have just taken prophylactic antibiotics, but specifically Pen V. Does anyone know before I go on why we give them prophylactic antibiotics? Yes, yes, very, very good. And this is another thing I came up with. I'm, I am a genius. Uh, this is <laughs> all the encapsulated bacteria that are common that you need to know. And some nasty killers have some capsule protection. And this is how I learned it. And actually, it was quite useful. So it does come up. And they'll tend to be, the, and the reason I accused Nicaea meningitis is because someone who's supposed to splenectomy or has hypersplenism is more at risk of these infections. And you all probably know that SBA fact that salmonella is, if you have osteomyelitis in sickle cell, salmonella is more likely than staph aureus in the osteomyelitis in sickle cell, mostly just because their spleen isn't working that well. So salmonella is more likely, but there we go. But here we go. These are the ones you need to know about. And that is me done for handover to Anoush. Um, I'm sorry it's a bit fast. I am going to upload my summary sheet of all the films and the causes I said before on the page afterwards. But I think that's, if you know the stuff we've gone through, you're, you're, you're doing well. Good stuff. Very, very impressive. So uh, Anoush, do you want to take over? Cool. So if you have any questions about any of the theme stuff we've done, just you can just ask them in the chat and I'm sure Jake can answer them. Uh, so for some reason, like something that kept coming up was vasculitis. So we're going to go over like a vasculitis case. So sorry, small text. Have a read of this. Um, while you read this, we can answer some questions. So about chest crisis, do you always give antibiotics? Um, from my from my notes, yes. I think that's because if they're having a chest crisis, it means that they're really not well controlled, and you're worried about them having. Uh, a, a superposed infection on top if their their lungs really aren't working that well. So from my notes, yes, but I, I am not sure. I have to be honest. I will say that um, I think a lot of patients who present with a chest crisis, if you Q-surfed them, they'd qualify under the sepsis criteria. So you just give them yeah, yeah, a broad exactly. spec un under sepsis anyway. That's a, that's a much better answer. Yeah. yeah. So, so remember, any acutely well patient, if you Q-surfed them and you're like, are they sept septic? you are allowed to start them on antibiotics regardless. Um, oh, that reminds, wait, before we start this case, uh, someone asked me something this week. Oh, in some cases, do you give oxygen when they're saturating normally? So if you if they're saturating at like 95 or 96 percent, do you still give them saturation in the context of an A to E assessment? Um, so the answer to that question is, when you get to, be, there's two, there are two reasons you'll give oxygen in an A to E assessment. 
either A, they're saturating below 94% when you do your breathing and you check their SpO2, or alternatively, when you get to C and you realize they're septic, even if their oxygen is normal, you can give them oxygen. That's fine. If you decide they're septic when you get to C, you're allowed to give them oxygen. So those are like the two main reasons you would give oxygen in an ATE assessment. In real life, it's a bit more complicated. Like if you if you see a patient and you think that they're going to get a lot worse, like it's a severe asthma attack, then you you would prophylactically start them on oxygen anyway. But for, for exams, those are the two main things you'd start oxygen for. Um, okay. So this is this is a real case. Um, I've told maybe I've told a couple of you about this. This this is. Uh, this happened to someone I know uh, a few a couple of months ago. So uh, in this history, what's your differential diagnosis so far? Just you can just spout ideas in the chat. We'll keep this broad. Yeah, it's someone who's it's someone from Indian origin. You always want to be thinking about tuberculosis. It, it's very much very common in India, and he lived there for 26 years. Uh, lung cancer, I don't know, because non-smoker, absolutely. Um, there's one thing that should point you towards lung cancer, which is uh, in particular. Does anyone know what I'm referring to? Th this man has a lot of risk factors. Yeah, he's a plasterer. He's probably had a, a exposure to... Um, industrial diseases and so things like asbestos which are used commonly yeah you you associate it with mesothelioma but remember that it also increases your risk of other lung cancers so yeah definitely um what other conditions can cause this kind of picture so this man has no risk factors for cherick strauss syndrome from this history. I'm I'm sorry, that's probably not what you wanted to hear. Um, could it be anti-GVM? It could be. So like there could be a vasculitic process, that's fine. We're talking about vasculitis, so yeah, that's fine. We'll talk about that. What else could it be? Vasculitis is the least important differential here. So we'll 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 talk about that in a minute, but the I the, the point I'm trying to get at is Vasculitis is super nonspecific and should never really be the first diagnosis you're considering in a situation. It should be one that you are considering, but you need to diagnose stuff that will probably harm it more. So what else could it be? So we've got cancer, we've got tuberculosis, what else? And we've got vasculitis. Um, could be a bronchiectatic thing, I guess. Very good. So everything is like variceal liver disease. So when when a patient say, says they're coughing up blood, sometimes you're not you you do want to check this this person has a history of alcohol intake. Is this hematemesis instead? So could it be a variceal bleed and that's causing him to throw up? What else from the GI tract apart from a variceal bleed? That's I like that. You get a thumbs up. You all get a thumbs up, but I can't be bothered. It's good. Yeah. So if he's been drinking a lot and he's if he's been Vomiting, like you want to be thinking about a Mallory vice attack. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What do you think the commonest cause of someone having blood in their mouth is? Out of interest. Not. Yeah, just. So epistaxis. So, so like, is it is it a bleed from the nose? Is it a bleed from like the pharynx? You also want to be thinking about that. So the way I split it up is. Problems in the mouth. Have you got bleeding in the mouth? And of course, epistaxis and other pharyngeal things you want to consider here as well. With the lungs, is it like an infection? Is it pulmonary hemorrhage due to cancer or due to one of the other processes we talked about? And if it's the GI tract, you can have gastric ulcers, you can have malaria vice tears, you can have varices. So when if you've got a patient who is not necessarily a reliable historian, you need to make sure that when, when they're talking about hemoptysis, what do they actually mean? And you might want to consider investigating other places. So based off your list of differentials, what kind of what are going to be your initial investigations?
you can have a chest x-ray. We'll look at the results on the next slide. You 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 are allowed to have a chest x-ray, yeah. What else? If we start at the bedside and we go upward. Yeah, do a urine dip. I haven't got put the results of the urine dip. Uh, let's pretend I'm a terrible foundation doctor. You should do a urine dip because they might have hematuria or other related things. Do a culture. Yeah, you won't get the results for a few weeks, a uh, few hours. So not. Uh, so yeah, we'll do a culture as well. What else? Yeah, so bloods, we should definitely do some bloods. Uh, we can check the urea, see if it's uh, disproportionately elevated to the creatinine, which would suggest a protein meal and a GI bleed. Um, a PR is amazing, a great bedside test uh, if they've got, if you're worried about melina, and which can happen with a GI bleed of varices, yeah. Uh, what else? CRP, ESR, absolutely. Is it an inflammatory condition? One other big group of tests that we've missed, probably like uh, pretty basic. LFTs are really good as well if you're worried about a um, bleed. A glucose, yeah. Um, so blood glucose probably won't, you would definitely do it because everyone gets it, but I'm not sure any problems in regards to diabetes would uh, would actually cause a presentation like this, but it's really important that you do one anyway. Yeah, what else? There's, oh uh, yeah, FBC and clotting for liver disease. So yeah, you're looking at full blood count because are the white cells normal? Are they increased? Is there an infectious process? Um, because remember, there are other infections that can cause what appears to be hemoptysis. So what other infections can cause things like that look like hemoptysis? He's an alcoholic. There's a specific one I'm looking for. Yeah, so a pneumonia caused by Klebsiella absolutely can cause like this current jelly sputum, which looks very red. And sometimes patients might mistake that for blood. Um, but yeah, that's really good. And yeah, remember that clotting is the number one thing that goes off when liver synthetic function is affected. So these... So like the one differential that we didn't really talk about is, if we go back to the case for a second, this man has a vascular necrosis of a femoral head. He is probably not very mobile um, because he won't be able to mobilize with that. Remember alcohol is a risk factor for that occurring. So anyone who's immobile, you definitely want to think about a PE. And remember that in, in a PE, you have a clot somewhere in your lung. And if the pressure behind that clot builds up enough, you can get pulmonary hemorrhage, which can cause hemoptysis. Like it's not a typical presentation of a PE, but like it's still something you should uh, you should consider. So the important factors here are he's got a raised D-dimer, he's got a raised ESR CRP, this fancy doctor decided to do an IGRA, which you're about to tell me about, and he also has a normal chest X-ray. So, is his D-dimer being elevated? Does what does that mean? What do we want to do next? Yeah, you want to you want to check whether there's actually a PE because D-dimer is, as we spoke about when we were doing CPP. D-dimer is an example of something that's a sensitive test, but not very specific. It goes up in a lot of other conditions. Um, we'll talk about the CTPA results in a minute. Again, ESR and CRP are pretty nonspecific. There's some kind of inflammation going on. Baseline bloods are normal, which means an infection is a bit less likely. What, what does IGRA stand for and what does it do? Interferon gamma release assay, absolutely. And what does it do? What do we use it for? It's used to test for TB. Um, yeah, it's 
used to test for people who might have latent TB. It can sometimes be positive in those that have been immunized for tuberculosis as well, but actually the number, um, it's better than the old test, which is the MON2 test. This person has a positive IGRA and a normal chest x-ray, which should lead you to suspect that this isn't an active infection. This is more likely to be either a latent tuberculosis, which isn't that uncommon when you've come from India, uh, or it might be due to him being immunized, although that is in the minority. OK, so this is what you see on a CTPA. You don't see any pulmonary emboli and you notice pulmonary hemorrhage. This no, this isn't actually a CTPA, this is just a normal CT, but you don't see a pulmonary embolus. You, you'll just have to trust me on that. Okay, so hopefully you've realized by now that you've tried to, you've ruled out a lot of the other pathologies that could be causing this picture. So, which of these tests is going to reveal your diagnosis? Let, let me open up a poll for this. So you should be able to answer. Oh, so many of you have turned off from the pod. There's only 30 of you here. There is, there is a nice split. Let me guess which, 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 is, which is between. <laughs> oh, I wondered too. We'll talk about each of these tests for a second. Right, so around, it's a 50-50 split between C anchor and P anchor. The correct answer in this case is C anchor. That this man doesn't actually have many risk factors for, for Churk Strauss or eosinophilic vasculitis based on his history. He doesn't really have a history of adult onset asthma. He had no eosinophilia on his full blood count, which makes that diagnosis a bit less likely. So it is likely, C anchor will probably lead you to the diagnosis in this case. Um, but if we go through the other ones, ANA is, goes up in loads of disease processes. It's not a very specific test, but yeah, it's used to test for lupus generally or general autoimmunity. And rheumatoid factor is the most sensitive test for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, both of those conditions could cause this picture. Both of them can cause a secondary vasculitis and cause this picture, but it's far less likely. Fibrinogen, it, I mean, it, it's not really relevant, but just remember that D-dimer is a fibrinogen degradation product. Um, so now we're going to talk about vasculitis really briefly. So first thing, is it, pri is it a primary autoimmune process or is it a secondary process occurring due to a cancer or due to an infection or even due to sickle cell? So like secondary vasculitis is far more common than primary autoimmune vasculitis on the whole. So you really do want to think about whether there's an underlying condition driving this entire process. But in terms of what you need to know for your exams, you've seen this diagram before, I've added some detail. How do we split up vasculitis? Size of the vessel, absolutely. Large vessel, medium vessel, small vessel. Um, so give me two examples of large vessel vasculitis. Giant cell arthritis, which is easily the most important condition that you need to know about on this slide. If you don't know the, any of the other ones, don't worry about it. Yeah, Takayasu's aortitis and giant cell arthritis, two medium vessel ones. Polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki's disease. Yeah, and then your small vessel ones split into uh, two different groups. So they split into your immune complex mediated and your antibody mediated. Okay, um, let's. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment at the end. So, does it? What what is your classical presentation of Takayasu's aortitis? So, who gets it? 
what will you pick up on examination and what are they at risk of? Those are my three questions so you can just answer in the chat. Young women, upper or lower limb claudication, depending on where they are, and you might notice a difference between the pulses or you might not notice a pulse at all. Absolutely. And it has a complication if you can get aneurysms, which can then rupture. So these, uh, so this is like a fairly urgent thing to recognize. Um, the best investigation you can do is a PET CT. It'll light up because it's inflamed. OK, so let's do the same thing again. Who gets giant cell arthritis? What are the symptoms? And what? how are you going to investigate it? Also, for, uh, just like um, we're talking about the big, like specific investigations, all of these will cause inflammatory markers to go up. But like the specific investigations you do for them are important. So yeah, it's like elderly people above the age of 55, they might have a history of polymyalgia rheumatica, temporal artery claudication. So it's jaw claudication when they're brushing their hair, temp scalp or temple pain, and they're at risk of blindness. So you want it. So the absolute most important thing is you give them steroids, then you do a biopsy. If you're worried it's giant cell arthritis, you give them steroids before you investigate. Um, one thing I will note, a few, uh, someone messaged me the other day asking, when, when do you give steroids exactly? So if you have polymyalgia rheumatica, you go for like a medium steroid dose. It doesn't really, like around 40 milligrams. If you have giant cell arthritis with no visual symptoms, it's high dose steroids. So that's like 60 to 80 milligrams a day. If they have visual symptoms, you give them IV methyl pred pulsed. So um, I, I'll put it in the notes for the slide. So remember, it's like three tiers. So you have like a middling dose, a high dose, or like a w w massive dose of IV pred. Um, fine. I'll run through the rest because they're not as important for exams. Uh, polyarthritis notice, it, I, you can get joint pain in all of these, but particularly in pan, and it can cause pancreatitis. Uh, it's something they like to ask about in exams is it's often a secondary to hep B. Uh, Kawasaki disease next year, it's children, coronary artery aneurysms, you give them aspirin. Uh, and then, so immune complex mediated, you get Henoxian line purpura, which is the rash along the buttocks, joint pain, and they might get nephritis and good pasture syndrome. And then antibody mediated, you have GPA and eosinophilic GPA. Um, and the antibody test is the difference between those two, as well as GP eGPA having a specific triad we'll talk about it in a second. Um, so the difference between, so if I go back to one of the questions, we'll finish on this, Where this is the last slide, don't worry. I'm struggling. How do you tell, I can't remember what the question is, how do you differentiate between anti-GVM and microscopic polyangiitis? So they, they have slightly different presentations, so anti-GVM is classically like an aneuric AKI. It's like an, no urine, acute kidney failure. Microscopic polyangitis, they'll get like a, um, a nephritic syndrome. They can get, I mean, it can be a nephrotic or a nephritic syndrome, but it's a bit more likely to be a nephritic syndrome. It doesn't tend to be aneuric and bam, they, they don't have like really serious kidney failure. It's a bit slower in onset. That's the big difference. And then you would definitely check the antibodies because they're very good for those. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. So, from this slide, well, from this case, what I want you to take away, GCA is the most important vasculitis that you need to know about. It's easy, it's the most common primary vasculitis in medicine. Two, vasculitis you should consider, but there are far more acute and important differentials that you need to rule out before you get to vasculitis. Um, are the two big things. Could the patient in that case have microscopic polyangiitis that can also present with pulmonary hemorrhage? I mean, it could be microscopic. 
Um, but microscopic polyangiitis tends to favor, it affects the kidney more than it affects the lungs. Like statistically. It, I mean, any vasculitis can cause anything else. It's just what do you need in terms of your exams? That's like, what, what, what do they expect from your exams? Like these conditions are like some of the great mimics in medicine as it's like sickle. They can cause a lot of things across the body. You just need to know what's common. Um, so last thing I'm going to finish on that you should know about. This should say eGPA. So Churg-Strauss syndrome or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, you should consider in anyone who has eosinophilia and adult onset asthma, and because that means a vasculitis process could be causing whatever other symptoms that they have going on. I will change that. So that's meant to say eGPA. Um, and that's known as the Churg-Strauss Churg syndrome. Uh, does any, anyone have any questions? Like people keep, uh, like people asked go through vasculitis, but I do want to say this, it just doesn't come up in exams a lot. I, Jake can verify, it just won't, like yeah, they, they, GCA ask might. You, they'll ask you about the antibodies. And that, yeah. I, that I honestly, they, you're not expected to be able to diagnose someone with a certain vasculitis really. You're meant to just know about the antibodies and that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the aim of the case was to more show you how non-specific it is and why you shouldn't really be, like you shouldn't rule it out really early, but you should still, be looking for other stuff first. Is the latent TV related with to the GPA he presented with? Uh, it was not related at all. He got treatment for his latent TV. So. Um, right, before you go, so this 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 has been slightly different to the other sessions um, based on Jake's like really unique quiz format. We're getting towards exams. We're wondering if you want more of those. So like if you do, let us know in the feedback and we'll see what we can do. We don't know what day we're gonna run these until because our exams are a week earlier than yours. Um, but what we can, what we might be able to do is the week after our exams, we can just run a session or two and you can just ask any questions you want and we can try and figure some stuff out. But yeah, let us know what you think as usual. Also, please don't ask for vasculitis again because it's not coming up and I, I, I wouldn't want you spending time on it. Also, I think Anoush, Anoush was absolutely right with the, your, everyone was right about the differential of a PE to go with, because that is so much more common. Is you have a SBA, what's the, and yeah. they have a presentation PE, but well, can't yes. be wrong. Or you, you not, as in like, if you consider that to be first, because it's way more common. Yeah. Just like, remember common stuff is common and most of your exam is common stuff. There's very, like, most of our exam was stuff that you would see if you walked into any district general hospital. This is not something you would see walking into any district general hospital. I've I've posted the blood films in the chat, or not the chat, in the Facebook page, if anyone wants to go through those. Uh, but, but again, SBA-wise, you're going to get majority of your information from the STEM, and blood films tend to be more Oskilandi than SBA. So they could include one this year because you obviously haven't had one, but I, I wouldn't be really worried about you know different shapes between how a jury body and a hand. I think, much. wait, let me stop recording before I say this. Yeah. <laughs>